Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 118, Harold of Bringlas. Hello to everyone who are, as you're listening to this podcast, uh, be it as it's been released or later on, I hope that uh, through this difficult moment in time in our history in the world, that uh, all of you are taking care of yourselves, that you're listening to advice of others, and just generally being careful and considerate. And uh, I look forward to being able to continue with this series with you all for many, many years to come. So hopefully we can uh, look back and see kind of where we were and where we are and compare it to some of the things that we've dealt with in history in the past and and uh, here's hoping that sooner or later we'll go back to more of our regularly scheduled livelihoods and lives. With all that said, and with all my thoughts with everyone, we're going to move on to the purpose of this podcast, which is to talk about Welsh history. So, let's get started, shall we? In the winter of 1401 and 1402, Owen Glendor had reached out and made some diplomatic efforts with various parties, including the Irish, the Scots, and likely the French, although we have no record of that particular outreach, it seems to make sense that he would have at least sent some sort of request to them, very similar to what was sent to the Irish kings and lords and what was sent to uh, the Scottish king at this point in time calling for aid and help. Failing to gain any ground on that particular front, Owen then decided to go on the offensive, taking advantage of the English weakness in not being able to or willing to campaign during the winter months. Glyndor went after his tormentor and that particular person's holdings, which was kind of the first and foremost agenda that he had. Some would say, and some argue, that this is more about vengeance than some sort of strategic motive. The specific person in question he went after was the uh, holdings of Lord Reginald Grey. Uh, Of course, Grey was responsible, at least in the accusations that have been made by our sources, for withholding information from Glyndor, for basically being the thorn in his side working with King Henry, and had spent the last year pursuing him, trying to get him into an open confrontation. Glyndor, on the other hand, had decided in January and February to raid the areas that were under control of Grey, such as in Ruthin. Uh, And then he went further, and in February and March, went after his property and lands in the Vale of Cloyd, and uh, this would damage Gray's ability to raise the capital needed to continue his harassment of Glyndor, at least I would assume that was part of it, as well as kind of getting his own back on someone who was trying to take Glyndor's land, trying to create this whole situation which they now were in. So, again, it is that question mark of, is it about gaining advantage or gaining revenge? Either way, however it would create many, many additional problems that I don't think anyone had anticipated at this early stage. Meanwhile, in England, the Percys and the Mortimers were working to try and end the conflict, or at least to get Henry IV to back off of Owen. But it appears that Grey and his allies in the Privy Council were not willing to bend. Even before these attacks took place, they themselves were unhappy with Owen had been trying to take his lands and stealing them, and thus the idea of having to give them back must have been something that they weren't really prepared to do, and thus now, with these attacks on top of everything, probably created a bit of a desire for revenge over and above what they already had decided to do. Henry IV was not really a man who is of an easy nature, and had consistently shown that he was ready and willing to use force and confrontation rather than to find easy or at least noble solutions. So Grey won the day, and there would be no peace with Owen. 
The traitors needed to be brought down once and for all. And that could only happen if the Welsh were brought low and were defeated. No forgiveness would be offered by this king, at least against the leaders of the rebellion. And certainly he was not going to give any quarter. And anyone who stood against him, he was very, very willing to take vengeance on. So in that respect, he allowed much of the problems that were developing to get worse. In April, after months of attacks, Gray finally met up with Owen, but not in the manner he was probably hoping to. Glyndor's forces ambushed Gray, killing many of his men and taking Gray prisoner. Humil the humiliation of Gray was now complete. He would remain a prisoner for much of the rest of 1402 and would only be released in November of that year. Gray was released, actually, after he his uh, heir and his uh, holdings basically paid most of a 10,000 mark ransom. And of course, as part of that, since the full amount had not been paid off, he actually put his heir in as a prisoner until the rest of it would be paid off, basically as an insurance deal. Uh, and this must have at least had some reflection on Gray's abilities and willingness to take on Owen, because after this, he never commands troops against Glyndor. So in some ways, this set in motion a lot of what was to come over the next year and put into place the fact that Owen was not to be trifled with and couldn't really be taken lightly anymore. But even with that, there's still some other things that were going on during this period which would reflect as well in the populist mindset if not during definitely after the fact in the spring of 1402 in an era of mythology folk tales and lore Halley's comet arrived soaring through the sky signaling in that day and age of either great success or great doom Iolo Gok had said of it See that blazing star, the heavens look down on freedom's war, and light her torch on high. Bright upon the dragon's crest, it tells that glory's wings will rest. When warriors meet to die, let earth's pale tyrants read despair, and vengeance in its flames, hail, hail, bards the omen fair of conquest of flame, and swell the rushing mountain air with songs of Glyndur's name. Of course, this poem comes after the fact, but nonetheless, this idea that Halley's Comet signaled something significant was about to change or some sort of disaster was something that goes back even to ancient times. There's, there's references to that particular comet being seen in the sky before certain major events in the world's history. And while, of course, you're not going to look up in the sky and say nowadays that Halley's Comet signals anything, uh, it, there is this idea, at least at this point. The English might have seen this as a sign of the end of times, for example, but if they did, they were not going to show it. Henry placed the Percys in charge of the campaign in some places, and using their resources to try and shore up uh, South and North Wales and to try and gain back some control. They did this through castle building, through repairs of fortresses, castles, and city walls, and setting troops up as in positions of rapid response through their naval forces at Chester or through the various borders, uh, forts and castles, and effectively they were meant to be quick on the draw, able to respond whenever the Welsh forces were in motion. This reactive force in early 1402 obviously is defensive in nature and offered little to stop the Welsh raiders that were rapidly making headway and, in fact, were too quick for they themselves to follow. The Welsh seemingly themselves, for the most part, were unopposed 
and continued to jab the English across various towns and villages that dotted the landscape on both sides of the border. Raids were now starting to happen in southeast Wales, which had hardly been a particular hotbed of independence to that point, and had been under conquest by the Normans since the early part of the 1100s. These raids led Edmund Mortimer, the current lord running the Mortimer March area holdings for in the name of his nephew, who also confusingly was also named Edmund, um, and was the, Edmund was the younger, was the presumptive heir to the Mortimer uh, holdings, but the problem was he was nine years old, and so was too young to run any of this or in any way create any sort of opposition to what was going on. So the senior Edmund raised the defensive forces in the area and did so with a mix of local archers, militia, and experienced warriors from across his various holdings in England and Wales. It was a sizable force with the financial resources to carry on a much more aggressive stance. His commanders were longtime campaigners like Sir Robert Whitney, who was an MP for Hereford, uh, who also had experience fighting in Ireland and Scotland and had been serving the crown as an ambassador to the Spanish Kingdom of Aragon uh, at the end of the last century. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far? in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of the new Medal of Honor podcast from Evergreen Podcasts, brought to you in partnership with the National Medal of Honor Museum. In each three-minute episode, we'll learn about a different service member who distinguished him or herself through an act of valor. We'll include stories from the Civil War to Iraq and Afghanistan, and from all branches of the military. We'll talk about service members who were overlooked for the medal at first due to their race or religion, and about those who were celebrated at the time. We'll hear stories of soldiers like Audie Murphy, future Hollywood star who mounted a burning tank to hold off German infantry in World War II, and people like Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, a Civil War Army doctor and the only woman to receive the Medal of Honor so far. Learn about these heroes and more wherever you get your podcasts. And before ending up as Henry's Knight Marshal, a position which uh, saw that particular person called as the commander of the English military to enforce law and order in the area, sort of like a uh, military police force in effect, rather than strictly a military, and were particularly just used in England and maybe Wales, but weren't generally used outside of the country. The other commanders were made up of sheriffs and justices of the peace and in many cases, were also MPs of various stripes in the Hereford area. These were not men that were counted as rank amateurs or political sycophants. These were men who were tooled in the art of war and in dealing with mobs and ruffians. More importantly, each of these men was interconnected through marriage, alliances, and politics. 
They knew each other and had a strong understanding of what was required and how to get it done. These were the who's who of military commanders for this area. With all of their vast experience and martial prowess, I'm sure that they they must have considered this battle as something they could certainly handle and certainly had no concept of what was awaiting them when they got to Wales. And so it was as they crossed the border and headed into the local area uh, in what was once upon a time known as the Kingdom of Powys, they ran into the Welsh finally. Finally, for the first time really in this war, Owen had decided to fight an open battle in at least a relatively open area. And so it was on June 22nd, 1402, at a hill called Bringlas. Owen and his second-in-command, Rhys Gethin, awaited the English. There was... These weren't a ragtag bunch of ruffian rebels or misfits or, you know, the remains of uh, the forces that were loyal to Owen. This was a actual significant force. The Welsh were not messing around this time. And because of their victories and just general ability to uh, stump the leadership of the English, they had been gaining forces and gaining experience in that particular situation. So they too were not coming in like some inexperienced amateur hour types. And in fact, many of them served with the English, were veterans of the wars in England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, and also knew much of the landscape in Wales because of course they'd been fighting there for the last two years. So obviously, with that position, they had a lot to work with. Bryn Glass was a steep hill. It was possibly fairly bare and grassy, but we're, we're not entirely certain. Um, certainly looks that way now, but there is some trees on it. But certainly at that point in time, it could have been quite different. But the uh, Welsh were said to have placed archers at the top of the hill, and that with a small force, which was to entice the English to attack up the hill. Meanwhile, there was a secondary force that was hidden in the woods and the valleys beyond. This will become important later on. And because this is a border area of this old king, kingdom of uh, Powys and Mercia, this was an area which had been a bone of contention between the English and Welsh, probably going back to the beginning of the Anglo-Saxon period. The Welsh... Quite simply, though, knew the situation better than the Army of the March. And with its various knights and experienced leaders, just didn't have that same source of understanding. The Welsh were not like the Southern Scottish or the Irish. They weren't generally gentle rolling hills and, you know, or in the French countryside of pasture lands and, and farms, this area was more rugged, there was more choke points, there was more ambush areas, and it was much harsher than anywhere else that the English had been dealing with. In fact, it would be probably more similar to the Scottish Highland areas, which the English were never really able to control. So with that in mind, this again gave them an advantage, and mostly the advantage that Owen needed. Sources are all over the place about this battle. Some claim ridiculously high numbers of casualties on both sides. Uh, some vary and say it's much smaller in the hundreds. Others say it's closer to maybe a thousand. And from what I understand from reading academics, they generally lean more towards the middle ground of it rather than the massively crazy upper level where there was a discussion of 30,000 troops, which doesn't seem rational in this particular situation. And the death toll being closer to, as I said, about 1,500 to 1,000. Um, so effectively what you end up with is you end up with the Welsh on the top of the hill with a large force of men between the archers and the soldiers that were with them. And then you have... Mortimer's troops who are attempting to go up the hill to try and destroy these archers as they came down to meet them. Instead, of course, the archers are pouring fire into them downhill. 
making it very easy for themselves while the English were trying to themselves probably fire uphill. As you can imagine, just from the gravity alone, it would be much easier for the Welsh to cause casualties with no hindrance to the shots they're making, whereas shooting uphill is much more difficult, the angles are much more awkward, your sight lines are terrible, and the likelihood of hitting your own men is probably larger, I would think. So with that in mind, then of course, if there was actually Welsh forces that were hidden in the tree areas behind them, this would explain a couple things, including the fact that this would then catch the English even more off guard. And with that in mind, the Welsh were able to kill or capture almost all of the senior members of this of this military, including capturing both uh, Mortimer and Thomas Clanvaugh, while Whitney, who we mentioned earlier, along with uh, another couple of knights, Kinnard, De La Bear, and Walter Devereux, were killed. Devereux dying a few days after he'd obviously been mortally wounded. With their leaders dead, mortally wounded, or captured, likely that meant that the English broke and fled the field, causing even more casualties in the process. The estimated death toll, as we mentioned earlier, was probably set around uh, uh, about 1,500 for the English side, if we stay conservative. We don't know what the Welsh side was, but in all likelihood, based on the situation, it was probably fairly light. You could almost probably say it was probably closer to in the hundreds, uh, if that, because of the way this went down. And this was a terrible defeat for the English. And they would then look to blame different people to try and save face. Uh, according, according to some sources, Welsh archers on the English side had apparently switched sides at a crucial moment in the battle, shooting the English in the back. Legitimately, this can't be proven or disproven because the reality of it is we don't know. In order for that to have happened, the forces arrayed on the Welsh side would have had to have negotiated with these archers well before. In the middle of a medieval battle site, you're not going to get a bunch of archers to suddenly switch sides. As well, the archers themselves could not be sure that they would suddenly be protected by, you know, switching sides and going over with the rebels. There'd be no reason for the rebels to necessarily stay with them and support their point of view. And even if they did switch sides, because they would still be perceived as being traitors and untrustworthy. So then you're kind of left with either they negotiated in advance, in which case that's interesting, because then that means that all of those people would have had to have remained quiet and silent as to not get exposed because if they commented even once the English certainly would think in their paranoia the English would immediately go after them so in all likelihood it, if you look at it rationally I think what you end up having is not a case of of these Welsh archers betraying their English lords but rather in all likelihood if it's true that there were Welsh hidden in the tree line. They probably came up behind these archers, slaughtered them, and then it made them easier to attack the English forces. So in all likelihood, that's more or less what would have made sense to have happened, much more so than some massive uh, conspiracy between the two Welsh sides. And the reality of it is, this was a bad, bad battle for the English. It was bad tactically and bad rationally to assault a hill with archers. And likely what happened was is people got their dander up in part because they thought they were fighting a less superior side and thus thought they could overwhelm them just with their numbers. So again, this goes back to the fact that they, having these Welsh troops hidden allowed them to sucker the English into this battle. And it turns into Glyndwr from being just this lower, nobody, noble in the English crown system to being someone who tactically was brilliant and was able to outthink and outmaneuver the English troops in a way that left them looking embarrassed. Something the English might have been loath to do is admit to all of this and it's easier for them of course to blame forces on your own side who you perceive as betraying you because when you 
downplay the role of the Welsh in general, it makes it much easier to sort of go that route and take that agenda. And of course, as we've often noted before, it suits your outrage and propaganda if you can point out to and spear the other side to question their humanity, to question their their sense of fair play. They do this, of course, as well by claiming that the Welsh women that were around the battle site would actually go in and mutilate the English dead, which makes zero sense in the long run and made zero sense in the short run, let's be honest. So it's... But if you're thinking about it purely from a, you know, presenting the best face on a bad loss, it does make sense to make those kind of claims. It makes the other side look so much worse, and thus it drives your own people to actually oppose them. And of course, this is battle is very poorly covered by our sources. It's the first battle in the war where the Welsh and the English have collided in open field, and it turns out to be that the English are not up to fighting this battle. And worse yet, they lost a lot of experienced nobles in the process between the capture and killing of them. So you've lost effectively an area of your most important nobility. And this will cause questions to be asked by the lords who are still around about the ability of Henry. It also gives the even more favor and renown to Glyndur, who almost now appears to have God's favor on his side. This victory, of course, allows Owen to get the renown he needs amongst the Welsh and also those enemies of the English crown. If people were starting to flock to his cause in 1401, they were now pouring in. This man was no longer a minor noble from some land in the English aristocracy. He was now a military and political juggernaut. And realistically, the way that the English had gone about trying to deal with this, instead of taking him out, they've actually created what amounts to political problems that will last for the next century and, in the process, created a national hero in Wales. In England, as word of the defeat reached Henry, he designated many of his sheriffs, lords, and knights to report directly to him. He then sent all of these various soldiers across all of Britain to protect the borders of Scotland, Wales, and the coastline in fear that they would be invaded, in fear of in, of a major uprising that would throw the English over completely. The king also mobilized the marches and started to restock and rebuild as many of the castles in Wales as possible from Carnarvon to Cardiff. And, but at the same point, as he mobilized these troops, he also set various figures in to do control various areas, such as Thomas Fitz Allen, who was the Earl of Arundel, was actually set up as a commander in South Wales, and he, unfortunately for Henry, was as much of a success as Henry was, and was unable to gain any sort of control in Wales during the early fall. The king himself led another expedition in North Wales, but that also failed because, and in the process, as inauspicious as it can be, he himself was almost killed when a tree fell, nearly fell on him while he was sleeping. Uh, and then to top everything off, really it was the weather, which was the biggest weapon in Welsh hands. It worked like magic against the English, flooding campsites, destroying the ability of the English to carry forward, and of course, probably sapping their morale in the same process that we mentioned before. By the autumn of 1402, English control in Wales was basically little more than name only. Few, if any, decisions were being made, little of the taxes were being collected, and the English only really controlled fortified forts, towns, castles, and cities. Outside of the urban areas, they had effectively been ejected 
and the Welsh now controlled much of the former English domain of Wales. And with that, we're going to wrap up for now. Uh, you can, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can always reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast, or on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day, and uh, we'll see you later. Take care. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. Hi, I'm Nikesh Raghani, commentator and host of the India on 99.94 podcast. Several times each week, my co-host Sara Waris and I will be bringing you the very best in Indian cricket chat. Whether we're discussing the legend of Julan Goswami, KL Rahul's strike rate, the men's T20 death bowling woes, or the latest controversy involving the BCCI, we've got you covered. You can listen and subscribe via your usual podcast provider. Just search for India on 99.94. You can watch us via YouTube and you can download the 99.94 app. If you love Indian cricket, then join our conversation.